deadly massacre in the Colorado mountains. Who was really behind what happened that night? This was a very violent crime scene. There had been a, a whole lot of terror happen in that home. High in the Rockies, where millions vacation, but only a handful brave the raw brutality of life above 10,000 feet, is the small continental divide outpost of Guffey, Colorado, home to a mystery as deep as the winter snow and a crime as vicious as a mountain blizzard. It's rare to get a call there of any kind, let alone something like this. Back in January of 2001, Leonard Post was an investigator for the district attorney in the area around Colorado Springs. On this New Year's morning, he's surprised to be driving up into the mountains on a homicide call. Guffey's a small community. It's very rural. Ranching community, good folks. When he gets to this isolated house in what's called the Bear Trap subdivision, Post finds that some of those good folks have just been slaughtered. 60-year-old Carl Dutcher is on the kitchen floor, shot at least two times, the bullets ripping through his body and lodging into the wall. His wife, Joanna, is in a heap in the bathroom, shot at least five times. What did the bodies themselves and where they were found, what did that tell you had happened? It told me initially that they had been sleeping. Mrs. Dutcher was in her nightgown. Mr. Dutcher had a, a robe on. I did not see any forcible entry into the home. So initially you would think that someone knew this family. And according to the neighbors, there is someone extremely close to the Dutchers staying here their 15-year-old grandson, Tony. But Tony is nowhere to be found. Not long after, the county sheriff meets up with Tony's mother, Jennifer Vandressar, in this interrogation room. Any questions of us that we can try, like I told you, we don't know. So the sheriff comes and talks to you, right? Right, and he, I'm like, where's my son? It's not really mixed, I can't decide if I, feel better that my son wasn't in the house? Or if I feel, uh, like, confused if he wasn't happy, do you know what I'm saying? I hope he just saw something and got scared and ran. That's what I hope. And then it dawned on me, he thinks my son did this. Did he have any firearms? No, no, he does not own one. Do you want to use one? His grandfather showed him how. So they think Tony, because they haven't found Tony, right. he's not in the trailer. Right. They think Tony's the person who's killed his grandparents. Right. And I just kept saying, you have to find my son. He's hurt. You have to find him. I seriously feel that there's something bad has happened to my son. And then it came to me. I said, he's in his fort. Please go check that fort. The fort, she explains, is a makeshift campground 100 yards up a hill, overlooking the Dutcher's home. When investigators get there, they confirm Jennifer's worst fears. They find her son, Tony, is a victim, not a killer. Leonard, you need help? Yeah. The boy is dead in his sleeping bag, his throat slashed to the spine. And I thought I saw a knife over there someplace. So it was a very bloody, messy scene. Yes, it is. How old is this kid? Supposed to be about 14. Was there evidence of a fight? No, no evidence whatsoever such an utter lack of a struggle, there is even a board game undisturbed next to the dead body. And the Scrabble game, of course, is a game for two people. Yes. What did that tell you? Exactly that. Who else was here with Tony? When Tony's mom, Jennifer, hears the news, she is so upset, she says she had to be taken to the hospital and sedated. But before she leaves, she gives a hint about who else might have been there. This young man, literally a choir boy, 15-year-old Isaac Grimes. At one time, Isaac and Tony were best friends. They even built that fort together. So they were that close at one point. Isaac was like it's a second son to me. He was at our house, Tony was at his house. They were very close. And would they spend a lot of weekends together? They did. I remember one time they, dug a trench in the backyard, uh, 
They'd go camping. Just fun boy stuff. As teenagers do, the boys had drifted apart. But now Jennifer tells the sheriff, according to Tony, the friendship is seemingly rekindled. He had told me that Isaac was coming up to go camping with him, and I was really happy about that because I'd missed seeing Isaac, and I was glad that they were friends again. So you thought it was a good thing? I did, and, I, and Tony sounded so happy. Did it sound unusual to you or even to Tony that after this split that there was going to be this New Year's Eve camp out? No, it didn't seem unusual to us. You know, teenagers, they fight and then they get back together, and then they fight, and they get back together. Could Isaac know what happened, or even more unfathomable? Could this 15-year-old possibly even be involved in the killing? When Leonard Post gets Isaac into this interrogation room with his mother just a few feet away, the boy's answers to those questions are stranger than he could ever imagine. He lowered his head, and he said that uh, he was under a huge amount of pressure. Do you know this is hard, though? I know it's hard. Because I, I have keep on more pressure than you can imagine. I can imagine. Yeah. Okay. And had I ever heard of a place called Guyana? Do you know about a country called Guyana? Yeah, Guyana. I do know about a country called Guyana, yes. What could an obscure South American postage stamp of a country have to do with a murder in the Colorado mountains some 3,500 miles away? And why is Isaac so afraid? I felt like there was no way out. They said that they would kill me. They said that they would kill my family. Stay with us. Teenagers Isaac Grimes and Tony Dutcher had been best friends. Now one is dead along with his grandparents and the other might be the murderer. As investigators try to get to the bottom of the case, they're left wondering what went wrong between the two boys. Once again, here's Jim Avila. The boys come from good families. That's the part of this that really bothered me. This could happen to anybody. I did a horrible thing, but I cannot take that back. So how did Isaac Grimes, this apparently normal, innocent-looking 15-year-old, get involved in something so horrible? He was just a quiet teenager at Palmer High School, Colorado Springs, Colorado. It's like any other campus, full of teenagers trying to find their identities. Fitting in, though, didn't come so easy for Isaac. I wasn't a people person. So you weren't Mr. Popularity at school? No. This is the first time Isaac Grimes has ever spoken about what happened back then, back when everything was still normal. Your parents describe you as a sweet boy. Sweet, maybe, but uh, strong-willed all the same. Did Isaac have a group? Was he in the jocks or the... No. Anything like that? He didn't fit in with any of those groups. And, and his grades weren't good enough um, to fit in with the regular smart kids. So he was by himself? Well, except for Tony. Long before they would be linked in a sensational murder case, Tony Dutcher had been Isaac's best friend. But as they enter high school, they've drifted apart, and Isaac is lonely. But his parents, Donna and Rob, start to see him with a new friend. Genocide, known as ethnic cleansing, has been practiced in the world by many cultures. His name is Simon Sue, seen here giving a speech in class. His strong personality draws Isaac like a moth to a flame, a charismatic senior paying attention to a nerdy freshman who's looking to be part of something. And one time I, I had said, you know, Simon's a senior, why is he hanging out with you? And he said, because I'm smart. Isaac and Simon began a schoolyard friendship that would last up until the murders, broken apart by two very different stories about what happened New Year's Eve deep in the Rockies. Isaac Grimes' version would send chills up the spines of hardened detectives. What would you have done for him? Murder. So pretty much anything. Yes. It begins innocently enough. According to Isaac, video games and chess matches. Before long, though, fun and games are over. 
Simon introduces Isaac to two of his other friends, John Metheny and Glenn Urban. And according to Isaac, the four teens become more than high school buddies. They are lured into a boys club bent on isolation and terror. At first, it was a very lot of compliments. Like, you're one of us, you're cool, you're part of the group. You're one of the band of brothers. Right. According to Isaac, he learns this band of brothers actually has a name, OARA, Operations and Reconnaissance Agents. On paper and in Isaac's mind, they are more than just four members too, all organized in a paramilitary structure with Simon in command. I started out as a lieutenant and then became a major and then a lieutenant colonel. Why did you want to be part of this group? To have friends, to be part of something bigger, something good. And what was the big organization's mission? He was a little fuzzy on that one. He sold the big organization as his parent company, basically. And then he had a small part of it, and that w was what I was getting into. He didn't know that he was getting involved in a cult, of course. I mean, he thought that he was affiliating with boys and doing something important. Dr. Kathleen Mann is a national expert on cults, a label she has no problem attaching to Simon Sue's OARA. This is the way that all these groups work, is that they get you emotionally invested, and then they start to um, disclose their inner purposes, and by the time you figure out what's going on, you're involved. In this case, involved in something increasingly militaristic. According to Isaac, Simon trains them for violence, shooting practice at a range like this, showing them how to clean and dismantle firearms. Then Isaac says he learns Simon, whose family is from the small South American country of Guyana, is actually getting them ready to help put down a threatened possibly just imagine coup attempt in a place few Americans can find on a map. News of what happened shocked this nation and the world. In fact, Guyana is best known for a cult tragedy of its own. A congressman on a fact-finding trip to the South American nation of Guyana was ambushed, shot, and possibly killed. The murder of American Congressman Leo Ryan and the subsequent murder-suicide of People's Temple leader Jim Jones and 918 of his congregation who followed him from California to the jungle outside Jonestown, Guyana. It remains the largest mass suicide ever. Guyana was supposedly the headquarters of the group. The group was based there. And what, if anything, were you guys supposed to do or be ready to do? To be uh, called up into service. Simon said he might send us down there to fight. 15-year-olds? Yes. And did you believe that? I believed that he would, if the necessity came up. Why doesn't somebody just walk away? How can you? You can't walk away. You open the door and you walk you away. You cannot. It is, you know, you don't understand the power of the situation, the power of indoctrination. Isaac's parents say Simon preyed upon their son, stalked him, and turned innocence into evil. So he was emotionally vulnerable mm -hmm. at that point. Oh, yeah. Now that you look back on it, do you think that was attractive to Simon? Oh, yeah. It's a shark in the water thing. You know, you smell blood, and, and, and I think Simon smelled blood. And that is Isaac's story. Simon brainwashed him to believe and do whatever he was told, including, as Isaac told us, kill. Not in the jungles of Guyana, but much closer to home at that campground in the Colorado mountains, as he admits to investigator Leonard Post in the Colorado Springs police station interrogation room with his mother right there. You did cut Tony's throat? Okay. Where's the knife? I don't know. You don't know? When he said, I killed Tony, what did you see in the eyes of this 15-year-old boy? I was very afraid, very, uh, very sad, very depressed, but scared. So you saw remorse? A huge amount of remorse, yes. It was a moment that you won't forget. But there's just one problem. I sleep perfectly at night. 
I have a clear conscience. I don't have blood on my hands. Simon Tzu says it's all a lie. When we return, who's telling the truth? Was Simon Sue the mastermind Isaac claims? I had been trained into obedience, like a dog at heel. Does he believe he's brainwashed? Who's not to say he brainwashes himself? And what does this third person know about it? It went from being a burglary to being a triple homicide. Stay with us. Tony Dutcher has been murdered, and his childhood friend Isaac Grimes has confessed. But the question remains, why did he kill? Once again, here's Jim Avila. I wouldn't have gone along with it if I had known the consequences or what was going on, but I went along with it. Isaac Grimes says he went along with whatever Simon Sue told him to do back when he was only 15 years old and a newcomer to Simon's group at Palmer High School, the OARA. I never knew Isaac before Simon introduced me to Isaac. Jonathan Matheny was a fellow soldier of the OARA, targeted and recruited. Another lost boy attracted to Simon Sue's band of brothers. A young man who now says they were all on the wrong path. What this says what now? Lost soul. And it sort of describes the way you're feeling? It's kind of been my whole life. It's just kind of a lost soul going the wrong direction. You know? Kind of a lost kid, lost soul. Pretty much says it all in those two words. They started losing their way when Simon supposedly asked his two lieutenants to go beyond the military-style exercises at the shooting range and commit a crime home invasion. Jonathan and I broke into a Target's house. It was a specific friend that Simon had from school. We burglarized that house twice and recovered weapons from there. And what'd you do with the weapons? Gave them to Simon. Isaac says Simon Sue is storing lots of weapons and telling him and the others in the OARA that it's all part of the plan to eventually help in a struggle in his family's home country of Guyana. And at no point did you think this guy's just a nutcase and making stuff up? No. Why? Why? I'm not sure. I think I should have. Were you scared doing this? Yes. I didn't want to get caught and I was scared of the consequences of not succeeding. Isaac says that in this mountain paradise, those consequences were made painfully clear. Like a much more serious version of that child's game Simon says, failure to follow orders resulted in immediate torture. Elaborate pranks, he says, that turned him into a 15-year-old automaton. Repeated punches to the stomach and being forced to eat and drink until he could hold it down no more. I used to vomit a lot. Just throw up? Yeah. Did some damage to my teeth, I think pieces of the teeth began falling off. Then there was always the hanging threat of execution or execution of my family also. Did you believe him that he could do that? Yes. He had me make keys of the house for him. Your house? Yes. He uh, had me bring pictures of my family for him so that they would know who to kill. I remember being very afraid that he was always watching me. I used to go to the bathroom with the lights off because I thought someone might be watching me. Your dad says at the end, you didn't want to turn the lights on at all in your room. Correct. It was dark. I asked him to put a bar in my window so it couldn't be opened. Isaac's parents saw their child change before their eyes, deeply paranoid and obviously in need of help. So as parents, you were involved and you weren't ignoring what you were seeing. No. You were seeing some danger signs. Yeah, and, and talking and yeah. And I thought he was on um, drugs. So you did know. you confront him? Yes, yes I did. And we argued about it. We, we did everything we knew how to do. And we called in every resource that we knew how to call in. We had him visit with our pastor. Um, we visited with the psychologist and uh, we visited numerous times with his school counselor. Mm -hmm. Through all that though, he is opaque. He will not yeah. reveal no. that he's being terrorized. No, 
Simon told him that anyone he told would be dead. So I, I think it was just very much um, very intentionally making sure that there was nothing that we could know. How did he view Simon Sue? He viewed him as a leader, as his controller, as his military superior, that he had powers that went beyond a normal person. Dr. Kathleen Mann, a cult expert, worked on Isaac Grimes' case and believes his story. He believed that he would be killed. Now, whether that makes common sense or not um, is not really relevant. What's relevant is that he believed this and that all members of these kinds of groups believe things that we don't understand. This is the byproduct of indoctrination. According to Isaac Grimes, the indoctrination takes a critical turn about the time they began those burglaries, when he is forced to repeatedly watch this video called Faces of Death. He said that I needed to toughen up, so he brought Faces of Death videos, which are basically just gory videos. Where people are killed and... Yes, and had me watch those. And what did it, effect did it have on you? I think that it desensitized me to violence. By now, Isaac Grimes is poised for the real violence. I had been trained into obedience, like a dog at heel. Simon said, do this, you did that. Mm -hmm. Almost like the game, right? Yes. Simon says. What did he tell you to do? He told me that I had to prove myself by committing murder. Murder. The intended victims, that unsuspecting family in the remote mountain outpost, the Dutchers. Isaac's former best friend, Tony, and his grandparents, Carl and Joanna. OARA was on the move, put in action, Isaac says, by Simon, who conveniently leaves on a family vacation to Canada, leaving Jonathan and Isaac to carry out the horrendous plot. So you took it as an order? Yes. Why didn't you just go to your parents and say, this is what's happening. I've gotten caught in this terrible bind. I felt like there was no way out. They said that they would kill me. They said that they would kill my family. If you did not commit murder. Correct. The night arrives. It's New Year's Eve. Jonathan drives Isaac up into the mountains. Tony is expecting a sleepover and some games in the fort. So it's no surprise when Jonathan drops him off and leaves. They were glad to see you. Yes. They had no suspicion that you were there to harm anybody? No. After dinner, the boys climb the hill to the fort, the campground they once helped build together. And now you will hear in Isaac's own words an account he has never spoken in public before, but revealed in this interview at the state prison where he is being treated for mental illness. What happens up at the top of the hill? Up at the top of the hill, we talked for a while. We uh, played some Scrabble. Um, and then I murdered him. He was wrapped up in his sleeping bag, and um, I pointed out what I said was a light in the distance that I wanted him to look at, and I kept saying, well, no, you're not seeing it, so I got behind him, and I murdered him from there. A cold, simple narrative that has haunted Isaac Grimes from the moment he wiped his friend's blood from the knife. The first thing I did was I looked up at the sky and I said, oh God, I did it. And what does it do to you even today? It sends sort of shock through me that I could do such a thing. And how difficult is it to talk about it? I don't want to talk about it. I really don't. And for a long time, even when confronted by police with his parents at his side, Isaac Grimes refused to admit it. And I really want to believe you, Isaac. I do. But I, I've got to look at what we have found here. And some of it isn't fitting. When we come back, police tear apart Isaac's story and the teens turn on each other. I have nothing to lose. I'm not calling the ones going to send us to jail. Who's going to think that your best friend is going to, you know, cost you the rest of your life? Who is telling the truth? 
Stay with us. When investigators got on the scene, they found the bodies. As news reports of the Dutcher killings hit newspapers and television, they are sensational. Crime itself is hideous. I, I can't believe anything like this has happened. But few facts are leaked by investigators. Isaac Grimes is at the center of the case because Tony Dutcher's mother, Jennifer, told him she believed Isaac had plans to be up in the mountains with her son on New Year's Eve. All he said was that Isaac was going to come up there to pull out my sleep sleeping bag, to find his sleeping bag. But early on in this police interview room, Isaac denies being anywhere near Tony Dutcher on the night of the murder, claims he hadn't seen him since school let out for Christmas. But as in many murder cases, there is often one big break, a little mistake that shows the murderer didn't think of everything. In this triple homicide, the mistake was about a watch, a gift from Tony's mother on Christmas Day. When we interviewed Isaac, he mentioned that Tony had a, had a watch. You describe the watch that Tony had, and you say you saw it at school. And he described the watch to us. It was a, a wristwatch with uh, a band that had from flames on it. It was the Christmas watch, and Tony had not gotten his present when Isaac claimed to have last seen him. It didn't make sense. I mean, if Isaac saw this watch, he had to have been at the Dutchers. Uh, there's no other possible way. There's only one way you know that he had that watch. Because you were there. Or you, saw, you saw it. That was the point where it couldn't go any further. The lies weren't being believed. The only way you could explain it was by telling the truth. Correct. I was thinking, uh, I'm trapped. But I realized that the moment of truth had come. Were you listening when I said, like the first guy that tells the story gets the best deal? Isaac decides to try to get that best deal after some private encouragement from his mother. What happened when you're alone with Isaac? I, I, I said, I, I know that you know something. And, and you just need to tell them what you know. So you thought he knew who did it? Yeah. And that the best thing was to yes. tell the truth? for him to tell the truth. And he told me that he killed Tony. Now he tells police his sinister story of threats and intrigue. Now what I'm about to say, this gets out of this close circle. I'm going to die. My whole family line is going to die. I mean, every drive from here to Illinois. For the first time, investigators hear it all. Simon Sue, the OARA, Guyana. Isaac admits killing Tony, but denies pulling the trigger on his grandparents, Carl and Joanna Dutcher. That, he says, was carried out by his partner, John Methaney. So Jonathan went up and whacked him. Jonathan Metheny, you'll remember, was another member of the OARA, the one who had done burglaries with Isaac, the one who admits driving Isaac to the Dutchers that night. Isaac tells investigators after the murders, he and Jonathan gather up some weapons, load them in the car, and leave. But on the way down the mountains, Jonathan calls Simon in Canada to let him know the mission was accomplished. Do you remember what he said to him? Something like he did it or something like that, referring to me. Do you remember if he used the word killed or murdered or like that? I don't think that they mentioned it directly, no. Just more of that it was done? Yeah. But Metheny has a very different story. He claims he was never inside that house. And even though he would later admit to being the driver, when first interrogated by police, he denied ever being at the crime scene and tells his mom he's being framed. What good is Duffy, Mom? I don't even know where Duffy is. I shouldn't get a good attorney, Mom. I do it. I don't want to pull some to the scan or something, Mom. I don't want to rot in jail for the rest of my life or something I didn't do. Sorry. Why would I say something like that? 
so hard. Yeah, you just make sure you get a good attorney. I there was no motive other than we wanted the guns. It went from being a burglary to being a triple homicide like it is with no point to it. I dropped them off and I picked them up. You didn't go inside the house? I've never been inside that house. There was no evidence, there's no DNA, there's no nothing to say that I was there. You didn't kill the ditchers? Of course. Who killed them then? <laughs> I can't say I wasn't there. What do we have today that tells us that Isaac is telling the truth and Matheny is lying? You have Simon Sue. At the time of the murders, Simon Sue was conveniently on vacation with his parents. But when police get him inside their interrogation room, the chess master is in check and threatened with a harsh sentence, gives up not just Isaac, but his buddy, Jonathan Matheny. I have nothing to lose. I'm, I'm probably the ones who are going to send him to jail. I don't... Right. Hey, but that's it. And I'll... I'll this you. is it. I'll, I'll testify it. Good. That's it. It was betrayal from the top. Simon tells investigators that in that phone call right after the murders, Jonathan implicates not just Isaac, but himself. Should we understanding who killed who? Okay. Isaac killed Tony and John killed other two. Who's going to think that your best friend is going to, you know, cost you the rest of your life? When we come back, was Simon Sue really controlling his classmates? What Charlie Manson did, that's a cult. What Jim Jones did, that's a cult. Heaven's Gate, that's a cult. What I did doesn't come to that level. Stay with us. Three murders and conflicting stories about who committed them. Two suspects point to a third, an alleged ringleader. Was he the one calling the shots? Here with the conclusion of our story, Jim Avila. His name is Simon Sue, an average student with what has been described as a brilliant mind, charismatic and controlling, descriptions he now finds insulting. I object to that notion that I'm too smart. You're a smart guy, Mr. Sue. That, you know, if you look at my school records, I did poor in school. You know, my IQ is, I'm not a genius by any sorts. In fact, I probably, I have an average IQ. And his paramilitary organization built to help his political friends in his family homeland of Guyana? Simon Sue, in his first TV interview since the murders, says that is fantasy land too. There are those who have now compared your organization and you to a budding Jim Jones. Okay. You've heard that, right? Yes, I've, I've heard that stated before yes did you have a cult no the definition but, of a cult okay. and you may know it is a group of people who are led by a charismatic leader okay who takes their money okay and leads them blindly okay all things that people have said about you you know the whole thing about a cult now what charlie manson did that's a cult what jim jones did that's a cult heaven's gate that's a cult what I did doesn't come to that level. Were you a charismatic leader? You know, again, charis charisma is, is, in, is, in, is in the eye of the beholder, let's say. What was OARA in your mind? It was a kid's group. It was uh, just a club, uh, you know, a high school thing, you know? Harmless? Harmless, yes. Very Except much so. that it did participate in burglaries to get guns. That doesn't sound too harmless well, to most people. No. There were burglaries. It wasn't for the for the aim of getting guns. You know, teenage boys. You know, you come across what did you a gun. Steal? Uh, those were the only thing we found of value. Well, that at the time, you, you stole know? guns. Right. Simon Sue's boys' club was in fact highly organized, as he later admitted when confronted with documents from the OARA. This purports to be the OARA command structure. Yeah. Where were you on this command structure? It's only one page. Okay. Um, uh, I guess I, I would be at the top. Simon Sue claims that Isaac Grimes is making up a story, and he denies being a commander of some kind of paramilitary outfit. But this piece of paper in his own handwriting contradicts that denial. And where are John and Isaac? Uh, somewhere 
down there, uh... You didn't give them orders? They didn't report to you? No, to it, it happened a few times, you know, we, that we had this thing going, you know? It was, um, it was make-believe, you know? Make-believe to Simon Sue, but all too believable to Isaac Grimes. How big did you think it was? I thought that it was worldwide. So there was no escape from it in your mind? Correct. But Isaac Grimes says you brainwashed him. Okay. Isaac Grimes also says a lot of things. And it's the easy defense. Did you brainwash him? I do not. Does he believe he's brainwashed? Who's not to say he brainwashes himself? They have two, of course, completely different stories. Was that a cult or a boys club? In my opinion, it was a, it was a cult-like group. National cult expert Dr. Kathleen Mann worked with Isaac Grimes' defense team. I'm telling you, though, that it is my opinion that Isaac Grimes was indoctrinated to do something that was against his own self-interest, and he did not indoctrinate himself. Did you tell Isaac that there were 105 people and that this was a you know, big organization? You know, Isaac, if, I don't know if Isaac believed that there was 100 or 5 or 2 million. Anything that Mr. Grimes has said about the OIR, I've never led him to believe any of those things. The prosecution needs Isaac Grimes to be credible because that is the only evidence they have against me. Simon says that you're not credible. You have mental problems, and why would, any, why would society accept your word? Right. Can you address that? I really can't. It's up to the individual to judge. You're telling the truth? Yes. Clearly, at the beginning, the authorities saw the OARA as a serious threat to Isaac and his family. Look at the security at this hearing for Isaac and John Matheny. Armed guards patrolling the outside. Death threats and tire slashings aimed at the suspect's families prompted tight security at the Park County Courthouse. Inside, both boys wore bulletproof vests for protection from possible attacks. Grimes and Matheny were arraigned on charges ranging from first degree murder to burglary. But even though police no longer believe Simon Sue is a threat and his organization out of business, Isaac's parents still live in fear, worried that the OARA is much more real than Simon wants people to believe today. You don't look at people the same anymore. They know where, where to get us and where we are. Capable of violent retribution even now. When I start a car, I, uh, I open the door and I have one foot in the car and I turn my head and turn the key. We have dogs, three dogs now that uh, will protect us, I hope. You're still afraid that, that somebody from that organization might yes. kill you? It's that real to you? Yes. So you don't think it was just four boys? No, not at all. In the end, none of the boys wants a trial in the Dutcher killings. Though only Isaac confesses to murder, all three of them plead guilty to conspiracy to murder and covering up the crime. Yes, even Simon said to the judge, I did it. You understand what it means to plead guilty. You understand what you're being accused of, which was planning the murders. Right. And yet you pled guilty, but today you're telling me you didn't do that. I wouldn't have had a fair trial. They all end up with harsh sentences. Isaac, 60 years. Jonathan, 66 years. And the supposed mastermind, Simon Sue, 53 years behind bars. That I still have a son in prison. <laughs> And I'm responsible. Nadia Sue claims her son only pled because she begged him to take the offer. She was terrified in the aftermath of 9-11 that someone who looked like a foreigner could not get a fair trial. So you felt you had no choice? I had no choice. Our son is going to, to prison for life or we have 53 years to choose from. Since then, she's written to Isaac in an effort to vindicate her son. And Isaac has written back to her and the DA, sometimes claiming he acted alone. But this is what Isaac wrote. During my testimony on your oath, I knowingly and willingly lied. So he says in that letter that he actually did kill the Dutchers, not just Tony. Right. But the letters are filled with outrageous rants, and Isaac's parents say they only show the full effect of his illness, his mental deterioration after suffering so long with the guilt of killing his once best friend.
The heartbreak on display the night Isaac Grimes first told his mother and then police how he murdered his best friend on orders of Simon Sue is now mixed with regret, even guilt. It was Donna Grimes who encouraged her son to fully confess before getting a guarantee of a lighter sentence. You know, if I had been smart, I would have said we need an attorney. But um, it, it didn't enter into my mind that he would need an attorney. I miss him. I really miss him. Perhaps the most tragic ending of all, Jennifer Vandressar, the mother of Tony Dutcher. Do you miss him every day? Every day. Her misery leads to drinking and pills, two suicide attempts, and then horribly, another life lost. One awful night under the influence, she drives the wrong way down the interstate and kills a 27-year-old father. I don't remember doing it. You don't remember driving down the wrong side of the road? I don't remember anything. She would serve five years in prison, alone with her grief, contemplating, she says, new ways to join her son in heaven. It's very hard to stay on this planet for me because in my mind in five minutes I can be with my son. And my son was everything to me. Jennifer now writes letters to Isaac, her son's killer. After years had gone by and I had learned more and more information about the circumstances, I had to forgive. I will never be done grieving and I had to learn to live with this. I had to learn to get up, and it's hard to get up in the morning and go every day. Through her pain, compassion for a boy who at 15 was convinced that he had to kill in order to protect his own family and save himself. A boy who found that Simon Says is no childhood 